We hope you enjoy today's program. Our next presenter is Mother Tynetta Muhammad. Please welcome Sister Tynetta Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Please be seated. It gives me great honor to be here once again at this beautiful sanctuary and mosque that carries the name of a woman, yeah. Mosque Maryam. All of us know the prestigious position that the mother of Jesus holds in the eyes of the entire world, whether they're Muslims or Christians or of other faith traditions. The holiness of mother begins before the birth of any child, whether they be male or female. And the woman, particularly as teaches the honorable Elijah Muhammad, is much more than what the world has made her to appear to be. She actually is the twin of God. She is the second self of God. So how can you be mm -hmm, as you are without honoring the woman, the mother, who gives birth to all creation? My son, as I entered Mosque Maryam, asked me if I would consider having a few comments to make on women's rights. And I said, hmm, I'm not sure if this is the moment <laughs> or the time to give it full justice. Because it would take a lecture itself uh -huh, to bring out the beauty of womanhood, yes, the beauty of motherhood. Yes. But because so much ha we have been exposed to in global politics, in the global world of the view of women, yes. in the Christian society, the Jewish society, the Islamic society, the Buddhist society, it appears that woman is a step behind the men. And that is because many reasons. There are historical reasons, but mainly because men have been engaged in war for 5,000, 6,000 years of history. And the woman is the object of the enemy when he invades a country. The first objective is to get that woman, is that right? Spoil her and put his seed in that woman mm -hmm, so that she will no longer be a part of that particular society out of which she was born, but she would take on the personality of the conqueror. And in this case, the conqueror has many colors. It is not just the white man that was the conqueror. We have every race that was created in this time zone of 6,000 years who vanquished their nearby neighboring countries. And what did they do? They took the women as chattel. And they made these women do their bidding. So one of the reasons, though it is not to be contemporary or future history, they put the women in the back room, covered her, so that she would not be displayed as an attracting force for the invader. Do you follow? So what we see happening in the Islamic world in particular, which seems to carry this view of de degenerating womanhood by putting her in a covering, a black veil or a black uh, covering. Hijab? Okay, there's another word. And recently there's been much attention 
on the country of Iran. And I'm quite sure that you have been listening to the news and hearing what the president is saying from Iran to the United States government and to the entire world. And one of the problems that we're seeing is that women all over the world are striving to become equal, is that true? With the men in the society so that they too can operate as functionaries within their governments, within their school systems. But to understand, as I said, takes a lecture to go deeply into this subject. Why are the women in Islam in particular shrouded? So I was sitting here and I thought, a thought came to my head. Women in Arabia, particularly, women in the Islamic world, predominant Islamic world, in the Middle East, in Iran, in Iraq, all of these countries that are under the gun of a military fiasco targeted by the United States government. If you see a woman wearing a complete covering in black, I thought about the origin of Mecca itself and that there is a sacred house called the Kaaba that is also veiled or draped in a black uh, cloth that covers its nakedness. <laughs> and the nakedness is uh, stone or bricks. So if you were to look at the bricks of that house and know the sacredness of that house, you could compare it to the sacredness of the female. Oops. Because in its origin, it is aligned to the heavens. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the original, original orb in the heavens has what they call the heavenly Kaaba, an architectural plan designed from the heavens that ultimately came down to the earth and was put in the sacred spot that we call Mecca today. If men and women take Hajj, and they do, they are to remove, now listen to this, all of the trappings of their traditional societies. They no longer wear the veil. They no longer drape themselves in their traditional dress. They no longer are assigned to a specific position or place. Thank you. Position or place to pray in the mosques. In Mecca, you move around the sacred shrine and there could be a man on your left, a man on your right, a man behind you or in front of you. But that is the only pillar of Islam, the fifth pillar that shows true equality between the male and the female. They pray together, they move together, and they are not veiled. So I wondered if this was a symbol of the ultimate reality of the world of Islam in the future where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said there would be complete equality between male and female, that women will be in the workforce as well as producing children and keeping their households, that we should even learn as women to be diplomats in the society, we should learn how to pilot planes, we should be a part of every moving mechanism that makes up the society and the civilization. So I close by guiding you to read Surah 4, which is entitled The Women. Out of this Surah, the three-fourths percent of the Sharia law that is practiced in Islam is in securing the rights of women, the orphans, the widows, safeguarding the rights of women is three-fourths of the Sharia law that governs the Islamic world today. So as I close, as my time has come to an end, I want women to be honored and respected 
as the mothers of civilization, brothers. And if you are going to aspire to be godlike, if you're going to aspire to be the image of God, there has to be a greater understanding and reverence of the woman, the mothers of civilization. So as you leave Mosque Maryam today, and after we hear the message from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, always remember that he's talking to he, she, and she, he. Him, her, her, him. In addressing this most critical message to our nation in America and throughout the world. Thank you for your honorable attention. Assalamu alaikum. I hope that Mas Marian and throughout the country you are ready to hear the message that God has for you today, especially for you coming from your brother whose heart has longed for the liberation and deliverance of his people. Will you help me to receive and to welcome right now here at Mas Mariam and throughout the country in the Caribbean, down in Mexico, our beloved minister, our beloved brother, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Please receive him. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That means God is the greatest, and we thank him for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his goodness and his mercy to the human family. That whenever any member of that family strays from his straight path and loses his favor, he always, before punishing, raises a messenger or a prophet from among that people to give them guidance in the form of divine revelation that they may be guided back to his straight path and back into his divine favor. We thank Allah for all of his prophets and messengers and the scriptures which they brought. We thank him for Musa or Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Esau or Jesus and the gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master W. Farad Muhammad. We thank him for his coming. We thank him for his searching among us for one who was best qualified to bear the weight of a weighty word and the weight of a heavy assignment, the resurrection of the mentally dead black man and woman of America and the resurrection of humanity from the grave of ignorance mental and moral, spiritual death. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. 
I want to thank uh, Brother Ishmael and all those who spoke before me. Thank you for your charitable contribution. Your attendance is also charity because you're giving of your time that you could have spent in other places to be here this morning to hear a message that I hope will be pleasing not only to Allah and his servant Muhammad but a message that will be pleasing to you. When you ask people to sacrifice what they love, that produces a great trial. Almighty God can never test us except by what we love the most. He tested Abraham by his love of his son. He tested Peter by asking him to give up the work that Jesus found him doing to accept an assignment that he knew nothing about. In asking the leadership of the nation of Islam to give up titles. It created in some a lot of pain. Because as a so-called Negro we love big titles. And sometimes striving for positions of power and influence is destructive to organization and it's destructive to nation. And as I mentioned last week, the beauty in Islam of the principle of Hajj is that when we take that pilgrimage to Mecca, it matters not if you're a king or a peasant. It matters not if you have wealth or no wealth, because in Mecca, none of that matters. When you go to Mecca, you stand in ranks, all wearing the same simple garment, divested of jewels and divested of your national dress so that before Almighty God, Allah, we appear as we should appear in life itself, as equals, equal servants of Almighty God. This uh, is going to bring about a transformation in how we relate to God and how we relate to our brothers and sisters. So today, realizing that some are in pain because it's like a title is a covering for a wounded ego and things that 
make us feel better than others is a false covering for a sickness that must be addressed if we are going to help our people get up out of the condition that they're in or help humanity to rise out of the condition that Satan has put the whole of humanity in. Now, I've chosen for a subject for us today Purification of the heart is a preparation for service. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us was that black people in America who were victims of the worst form of slavery ever introduced to members of the human family, the transatlantic slave trade, where a whole people were stripped of their humanity and reduced to the level of the beasts of the field as a burden bearer for the real citizens of America, the Caucasian people. Whether you realize it or not, we have not yet been healed of the condition of 310 years of chattel slavery and 150 years of mental bondage under an oppressive ruler living under injustice. We just have not been healed. And the sickness of our community can be seen in every black community across the country, in the Caribbean, in Africa, this self-hatred that makes us destructive of ourselves and our neighbors and very, very difficult to unite so that we might remove the impediments that stand in the way of our progress as a people. Now the scripture teaches us the Bible. I, I'm going to speak to the Bible and then to the Quran. The scriptures teach us that in the last days of the world, God would come. He would appear. He would choose for himself a people for a special purpose. The Bible describes that people as the lost sheep the prodigal son, a foolish people, a people who had been brought to nothingness. And by nothingness it means you have no real existence as long as you are considered nothing. You're present, but you're Power is absent. So you're moved about like dust is just easily moved because you really have no presence in this society unless the enemy gives you a presence. 
I want you to pay attention to me. In Islam, we don't use the term a chosen people. That's a term that is biblical, that relates to God's choice of the children of Israel. Now, God has always been choosing people. And the sad thing about being chosen is that you don't understand why you're chosen, the purpose for God's choosing you, so you wear it as though you are better than somebody that you believe is not chosen. This is the mistake that members of the Jewish community have made. There's a certain arrogance that attends with the word, I am chosen. A man of means can come to a woman and he chooses her to be his partner for life. And there were many, many women that might have wanted to be his partner for life, but he chose one. Now, what did he choose her for? Did he choose her so she could preen and prance among the other women that were not chosen to say I'm better than you, I'm more beautiful than you, I'm more shapely than you. No, 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 no. When a wise man chooses a woman, he chooses her to complement what God has caused him to discover of himself. So when he chooses her, he chooses her to perform a service for him as he performs a service for her and they both perform a service for God. And just follow this. When God chose the children of Israel, he didn't choose them because they necessarily were better. In fact, they were pretty foul. What? Yes. Why would God have to send down commandments to a people who were righteous? Don't set up another God beside me. Don't bow down to any graven image. Thou shalt not steal. Well, evidently they were. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Evidently they were. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, he was dealing with a foul people. But yet, he saw something in them that he could use for a higher purpose, but they had to be reformed. They had to be made fit for the job that God intended for them. So Moses was sent not just to give them good news and warning, but he was sent as a purifier to make them ready for the job that God intended for them to do. And whenever God gives you a job to do and you fail to do it, you broke your covenant with him. So it's like a contract between two people. If you paint this and do that, then this is what you get. We agree. But then you don't paint, but you want the money? No. You have to perform your part 
of the covenant in order for God to fulfill his. He never breaks his word. But if you break your commitment to him, he's not justified in keeping his commitment to you. Well, now, in Islam, we don't say the Arabs were chosen people, but it's clear that they were chosen. Chosen for what? Chosen to receive a revelation called Quran. Chosen to receive the guidance from God through a prophet from among themselves. Chosen for a purpose. And that purpose was that they had to spread this message to the ends of the earth until all humanity had a chance to hear the message of the Quran. Well, sometimes we get lost because when we feel we have something that others don't have, we get lost in the success as many got lost in the wealth that came from the victories that they had. And the Muslims became so wealthy, so strong, so powerful that they ruled the known world. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, three generations after me will no longer be of me. So even though they were victorious in battle and became wealthy and led the world in science and mathematics and in all fields of human endeavor, they lost something with their victories and their wealth. They lost the essence of what God chose them to do. Well, brothers and sisters, we believe that we are that lost sheep that God would choose in the last days of the world. We believe we are that foolish people that God would choose and he said, I will be their God and they will be my people. We believe that we are that people that this world has set at naught, meaning made nothing. But God would take nothing and confound the world with what he was about to do to a people that the world considered nothing. But you know, when the slave master had us on that plantation, part of making us a slave was to destroy in us a true feeling of self-worth. When you're a slave, the way you make a slave is you destroy that slave's concept of self. You destroy the slave's concept of family. You destroy the slave's sense of history, tradition, culture. Then you appear to the slave as his master and then you beat fear into the slave so that the Fear will cause the slave to obey you as a master rather than obeying God. So if you are afraid of God and you submit to God, God will make you into himself. But if you're afraid of your former slave master and he, you submit to him, he will make you into what he has made you.
a people of nothingness, a people void, a people broken, a people divided, a people destroyed for the lack of knowledge. It is your submission to your former slave masters that has made us into this grotesque form that we are in. So coming into the nation of Islam or coming to push or coming to the NAACP or coming to the Urban League or coming to the Panther Party or coming to any organized effort, we come sick. We come diseased. We come with a bruised and wounded ego. We come with a heart filled with diseases. And the diseases aren't made manifest until one rises from the midst and is given some authority. One rises from the people and is given a title. Then all of a sudden, the title becomes a covering for true feelings of inferiority. So now we have to try to make somebody else feel inferior so that we might feel superior because of the title that we have that we are not qualified to wear. Every black organization suffers from disunity. The church is filled with people who love God, love Jesus, but don't love each other. The mosque is filled with people who love Allah and love Muhammad, peace be upon him, but they don't love each other, so they're divided and disunited and filled with fear of an enemy that hates the religion of Islam. So, the nation of Islam that was founded by Master Farad Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad 77 years ago for the rise of our people for 77 years has had a problem with laborers. It was that way when Master Farad Muhammad was here. It was that way under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It is that way with Louis Farrakhan. It doesn't matter what faces change. The problem of labor, the problem of those who want to help but yet are hindrances because of the condition of their mind and the condition of their heart that a title or a position seems to cover. But when you look at people who attend church and are happy over the song that's sung and happy over the beauty of the sermon that's preached, they're not happy with one another. And if you look in the mosque and you hear a great lecture and you, you are happy, but the minute that is gone, you are not happy with each other because somehow those in positions of authority have been unsuccessful in creating a true brotherhood. 
because the spirit of pomposity and false pride and arrogance militates against the producing of brotherhood and without brotherhood and the love of the brotherhood no organization and no nation can be successful so in removing these titles the only one we can't remove is the one that God gave. That title is in the Quran in the 30th chapter, the 30th verse. Set your face for religion, being upright, the nature made by God in which he has created man. So whether you know it or not, you are born by nature to submit your will to do the will of God. And you are born by nature to grow into uprightness. Just as you started your life on a horizontal level, but without anyone teaching you, after a while you saw something that you could pull up on and you pulled up and stood upright and began to rise above animals that have to walk on four legs or crawl on their bellies, you rose in uprightness because that's the nature in which God created you. Not only to walk upright physically, but to be upright spiritually and morally in your dealing one with another. What kind of disease has afflicted the heart? I'm going to point out some things, and if it fits us, don't put it on somebody else. <laughs> Just take the shoe, try it on. There's no Cinderella in here that one shoe fits one person. I'm putting shoes out that everybody can try and we'll see which one fits. Now, I'm going to speak to men first. Have you noticed that it is natural to want to be respected among your siblings? natural to want to be loved and if you move out from your family into society it's just natural that you want people to respect you and even to love you that's not a bad desire but when an enemy has crushed your self-concept then you try to do things to make you feel accepted. Watch, watch. Some of us, all of us, like nice things. And we live in a country where they keep putting before the world beautiful material things that titillate our fancy and make us desire to possess it, right? Sis, I'm going to jump over here a minute. 
If you are window shopping and you see a lovely dress that you think would look real nice on you and kind of make you feel special, won't you try to get it? And you can't wait to wear it, especially the church. <laughs> because you want somebody else to notice how well you look, especially when you come up for communion. <laughs> Talk to me. This is just talking to my Christian family. And I've watched on Easter Sunday how when it's communion time, I mean, the sisters just come on down that aisle. And a bit more thinking about the meaning of the wafer and the meaning of the wine and even Jesus. But did you see me? I know I knocked her socks off with this. And then if you see somebody went in the same store, got the same garment. Lord, how destroyed you. You don't even want to walk down the aisle then. So you hate uniforms. Because a uniform disallows you, one person to stand out over another. So that beautiful sequin dress or that beautiful silk or that beautiful brocade, whatever you got, it doesn't mean anything when we're all dressed the same, and then we have a problem with that. Well, as men, you know, you like designer things. I want designer shoes. Mama, don't you buy me one of them sneakers that ain't designer. You're talking to your mother as though you brought some money in the house. She has to buy you the latest Air Jordan 195, 185, 165, when she could have got you something to cover your feet for $25. But I ain't wearing that. What is the difference between a $25 sneaker that covers your foot and a 165 to 85 dollar pair of Air Jordan. What's the difference? The difference is that your wounded ego could say, I'm wearing the best. See? So in reality, you dress to show others you're better. By means of the suit you wear, the car we drive, the rings, the gold, the bling bling, whatever you got on, what do you need it for? We don't need it but we use it so that we can walk among our peers and make them look at us and say, wow, look at that. But has that made you a better person? Has that added anything to your knowledge? It just is a covering for a wounded self-concept and you don't know how to really be great. So you use things and the acquisition of things to give you a sense of greatness. But when you take your Rolex off and put it in the drawer, when the car is parked in the garage, when the suit or the dress is hung up in the closet when the weave is taken off and pulled. 
<laughs> then, then, then who are we then? See, if you feel like nothing when you don't have these things on that sets you apart from others, if you don't feel good without those things, then the heart is missing something. The mind is missing something. And when you dress yourself with a title that makes you feel good about yourself, but if the title is taken, you feel empty, then you were empty from the beginning. So, this emptiness has to be healed so that nothing outside of you will make you feel better about yourself. It's what's inside of you that will make you feel powerful. Now, what is meant in the scriptures, dear Christians? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Didn't say greater is what I have on me. Greater my possessions, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Well, if you feel empty and you're a Muslim and you feel empty and you're a Christian and you feel empty because you're a Jew or you feel empty because you're a Morris scientist or you feel empty because you're a nationalist, it's because nothing on the outside has been able to affect you on the inside. Therefore, you are in want of that which is real. Because what you have that makes you think you're something is not reality. A man has a lot of possessions. And naturally, when you work hard or steal, <laughs> and, 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 and you have a lot of possessions, it's awful when a fire afflicts you. When you come home and you have nothing left, But if you have something on the inside right. Go ahead. that did not die with the fire, then whatever was on the outside that you lost by the fire, you can always get it again. The Quran says, Allah originates the creation, then he reproduces it. Well, didn't you reproduce yourself when you had a child? Well, if you can reproduce yourself, then you can reproduce anything that you got if you got the right thing on the inside. Now follow this. Paul was the great preacher to the Gentiles. And Paul said, the Jew is not the Jew outwardly by the circumcision, 
of the male instrument. The Jew is the Jew inwardly by the circumcision of the heart. Now let's just study just a few minutes on that. If by Jew you mean one with a covenant relationship to God based on obedience to his laws, statutes, and commandments, well, if I say I am a Jew and I've been circumcised, which was an order by Moses that all Jewish boys should be circumcised. Well, Paul is trying to initiate people into a higher manifestation of a covenant relationship with God. It's not about circumcising the penis. It's about taking away the foreskin that covers the heart so that the heart may be washed and cleansed. Now when you see pictures of Jesus, sometimes you see him with his heart exposed. Because he was a man that there was no guile in his mouth. There was no deceit in him. So his heart was exposed. He had nothing to cover, nothing to hide. And what Paul was asking the early Christians to do was to purify the heart. Cut away that which covers and hides the debris that can set up in the male organ if you don't pull the skin back and wash then that instrument when it is inserted where it was created to insert to create life you insert disease along with the life germ. And so the female that is having a relationship with an uncircumcised, unclean person can become diseased. Well, what about those of us in leadership? who call ourselves imam, minister, cardinal, president, pope, mullah, sheikh, professor. All these things that you go to school to get as a title. But did you clean? Are you clean? Listen, listen, just listen. If this is a little boring to you and you, you, you feel tired, I will excuse you to go wash your face because I don't want you to miss this. Because you are diseased and the doctor is in the house. lofty titles and positions that we have do not forbid us from poisoning people with the diseases of our heart. No matter how pure the word may be that we speak, 
if the vessel out of which we speak is diseased, then the impurity of our heart begins to infect the word. So if one Christian does not like his Christian brother, one denomination feels you're better than another, one sect feels you're better than another, then when you speak, the envy, the jealousy, the hatred, the bitterness comes out in the word and it contaminates the word and when that word enters the ear of its hearer, the hearer of the word begins to reflect the condition of the heart that spoke that word. Have you noticed people in leadership can make people who follow them hate what they hate and love what they love and hate whom they hate and love whom they love? So if we have no love for one another and are in positions of power and authority and speak to people, let me give you an example. Most of us are guilty of gossip, slander, and backbiting. You don't know a person, but it's so easy to come out of your mouth with something that you heard. Well, you know, I, I read in a certain magazine that so-and-so was a homosexual. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have a sexual relationship? Oh, no, not me. No, no. I, I'm not that way. You know nothing about the person, but then you start repeating what you heard. So as you repeat slander, then the persons that you talk to, that you act as though you're an authority, they begin to reflect your mind. And then they start repeating, oh yeah, that person's a lesbian, this one's a homosexual, that one is guilty of this, and that one is guilty of that, as though the person speaking has no fault whatsoever. So we delight in putting each other down. Even if what you're saying has merit, your motive for saying it puts you down or me down in the eyes of God. And that's why I chose for my subject today, purification of the heart is preparation for service. Now, if you're a fireman, well, you got to go and learn how to be a fireman. Ain't nobody asking you to be pure. Let's put the fire out. <laughs> you go for a police exam, nobody asking you, are you pure? They said, do you want to help kill them Negroes? Do, 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 do you want to, do you want to keep down crime? Nobody asking you, are you pure? But if you and I want to be servants of God and humanity at the highest level, a title can't give it to us. 
No amount of ego gratification can give it to us. But the thing that will give us that quality at the highest level of service is, and it demands of us, the purification of the heart. Now, what do we mean purify? Come on, I'm not going to be here long, but I, I really want to get this subject over to you. To purify means to cleanse, to rid a of foreign or unwanted elements to free from guilt, sin, or defilement, to become pure or clean. A Muslim is not permitted to pray until we make what is called ablution or wash. And if we've had sex, we have to take a complete shower what and if you don't have water it says betake yourself to the earth to the mud because mud has a purifying part to it if you put it on and let it dry and knock it off it takes impurities away that's why women who want to clean their skin get a mud pack So if we are going to serve God and serve humanity and serve our people at the highest level, there has to be an active process of purification. So Jesus said to the disciples, wash and be clean. He wasn't just talking about take a bath once a year or once a week or once a day. The real washing as water and the cleansing by water gives life to the physical body. The purification of the heart and mind gives life to us spiritually. So washing and being clean is a part of being chosen for service. See, I, you know, I, I thought about this subject for several days, and I thought about us, and we're so used to a certain type of lecture that doesn't challenge us to be better than what we are or to grow from where we are, that sometimes when we're challenged by a word that makes us really look at ourselves, we want to bust the mirror because we really don't want to see the rottenness of self. Purify. Purify what? The heart. Well, this heart is not the heart. This heart, if you've got impurities in this heart, this heart pumps the life fluid throughout this entire body so if there's impurities in the blood then there'll be impurities in the brain impurities in the organs because the heart distributes the blood throughout the entire system that we call body that's how important the heart is to this entire organism all right People get heart attacks. And when this heart cannot pump blood in adequate supply to the brain, 
then you go into a comatose state and even become a vegetable. And they can put you on a life support system because this failed and they didn't get it started in time to get an adequate supply of blood to the brain. But the heart that we're talking about is the vital center of one's being. The vital center of one's emotions, sensibilities, the core of the person's mind, the seat of his intellect, out of which come all the issues of his or her life, it springs from that core. If you open the Quran to the second surah, it uh, talks about lip profession. Now a lot of us use these lips and we use speech to just lie. Don't mean nothing we say and we just talk though. Gotta have something to say. So the Quran says, and there are some people who say, we believe in Allah in the last day and they are not believers. They seek to deceive Allah and those who believe and they deceive only themselves and they perceive not. In their hearts is a disease. So Allah increased their disease and for them is a painful chastisement because they lie. Then it goes on to say when they mock believers, Allah will pay them back their mockery and he leaves them alone in their inordinacy, blindly wandering on. So what is inordinate? Inordinate person is a person that has exceeded certain limits a very disobedient, rebellious person. Well, any time a person is inordinate or rebellious, their hearts are hardened toward the very thing or the very characteristic that would give them the type of growth that they need to become a reflection of God. Their hearts are hardened. They're mockers. That's a heck of a disease. Now, most of us, I said earlier, are victims of wounded egos. The ego is the self. It's the personality component that is conscious that most directly controls behavior. Ego. Ego. Have you heard when people want to have a serious meeting, they say, leave your egos at the door or outside the door? Because people that are ego-driven, they cannot debate or argue a point without animosity coming into the argument because 
if you reject what I say, it's like you took a slap at me. So when somebody comes with a greater argument or a greater truth, we can't hear it because our egos are involved in our conversation. Some people talk just to elevate themselves above others. Some people talk about their accomplishments because they want others to bow to them. You know, uh, I, I was great, man. I'm, I was with Muhammad Ali one day in New York, and we came out of the restaurant, and the children just ran and gathered around Muhammad Ali. And he was with a man that probably was one of the greatest fighters of all time, Sugar Ray Robinson. And the children knew nothing about Sugar Ray, but they knew Muhammad Ali. So Ali looked at the children and said, do you know who this is? This is one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. He inspired me. Sugar Ray Robinson. The children looked at him and went right back to Ali. <laughs> now, what is it about being the star of the moment? And what makes you feel good when you can meet somebody quote unquote that's a big shot. They don't have to be good people. They could be rich people, but not good people in the eyes of God. But, man, you know who I was with today? I was with Oprah Winfrey. I was with uh, that great ball player, Shaquille O'Neal. I was with, yeah, 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 that's great. Did that make you any different? You mean the only thing you could use to make your friends see you as better was that you were in a restaurant downtown and you saw Muhammad Ali and you went up and got his autograph. And did that, did that add something to you personally? No. But when your ego is so wounded, you're trying to find something to hold on to that you could use to make others think more of you than you really think of yourself. No, 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 no. Just, just listen, this is ego. Michael Jordan, probably one of the greatest basketball players that ever played the game, but most of us who become great, we sacrifice balance. Because the thing that made us great is the thing that fed our ego. So I'm a doctor, I'm always on call, but what about your wife and your children? Well, I, I'll be there. See, why don't you have time for your wife and your children? It's because being a doctor gives the ego gratification. I'm a speaker, a preacher, a teacher. I love to teach. When I go home, it ain't brother teacher that has entered the house. It's either my husband, my father. Then now you've got duties as a husband, you've got duties as a father. But if you sacrifice your family 
and the balance that is necessary, then why did you do that? I'm analyzing myself. I did it because a wounded ego demanded that I give everything to this that gives life to the ego and makes me feel like I'm somebody. See, it takes a lot of growth to outgrow that kind of mentality, man. And that's why Michael is not married. He's gone through a divorce. But he's a great man. But a great man doesn't mean it translates into a great father. A well-known man doesn't translate into being a good husband. Do, do you follow what I mean? A rich person, it doesn't mean that you're a good brother or sister to your family members. It just means what it means. You're the greatest basketball player that ever did it, but in the final analysis, who are you? See, playing basketball doesn't make you what God intended for you to be. Playing football, singing your song at the blues, house of blues, and knocking the house completely out. Everybody on their feet screaming. You come off the stage, <laughs> you see what I did? Now I go home. Go home. Because your wife don't care how much you sang. Your wife want to know what you bringing home. Can we pay the bills? Or are you supporting them other loves that you have out there? Your children want to know, they know you can sing. Yeah, they, they hear your records too. But have you made a record at home? And why haven't we? Because there ain't no applause at home. Ain't nobody saying, here come the king. Here he come. See, brothers and sisters, the Bible says no one can add one cubit to their height. Now, you can put on stiletto shoes, sis. Get yourself all out of whack. Because you're really hurting yourself. You make somebody rich because you look tall. Ain't that nice? But at some point, them shoes hurt. So you sit down and you ease off your shoe, you know. <laughs> Child. So at some point, reality has to set in. The shoe has not added nothing to you but a false sense of being tall. The wig has not added nothing to you. Except now you got hair. Praise God. Brother, we can dye our hair, we can put false teeth in. Some point you gotta take them out. Put them in the cup. Some point the gray gonna shine through. These are superficial things. What God wants to do is add something to us that gives us value, not from a material perspective, but from an, a perspective of spiritual and intellectual and social and material advancement based on intellectual and spiritual advancement. Now, this is what God wants to add. Now, I'm going to come to um, a conclusion here. 
What is one of the biggest sins? Well, it's usually one of the first of the seven cardinal sins is called pride. Pride. And pride is a sense of one's own proper value or dignity or an overly high opinion of oneself. Now, when you're ego-driven, you see, you fight for recognition of a title. Uh, Brother Farrakhan, just a minute. I'm Minister Farrakhan, and, and don't you forget it. Well, uh, brother, I'm a counselor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor. Call me by my title. Well, that's nice. But isn't it better to be a brother? Isn't it better to be a sister? I mean, why is being a brother to your brother and a brother to your sister, why does that lessen your dignity as a human being? And why does calling you by a title increase your dignity? So the characteristic that everyone who wants to serve God and serve our brothers and sisters and serve humanity, the very characteristic that we must possess is the characteristic of humility. Humility. Humility is characterized by modesty or meekness in behavior, attitude, or spirit. Some of us walk like we scared somebody gonna attack us, so we got to put on the baddest front. I don't know why. I, and you bring such a nasty disposition, people won't bother you all right. But it's not because you're bad, you just have a funky attitude and nobody wants to be bothered with you. And some of us, have you watched President Bush? that he has to do that shows that inwardly he's not that. It's the position that makes him think he's more than what he really is. And a year and a half from now, when he's no longer president, watch how he walked in. Are you walking any less because you don't have a title? My God, if you can't walk strong without a title, then you're not a strong brother. You're not a strong sister. You never really were for the organization and its success. You were for yourself and your success at the expense of organization. So if purification of the heart 
is preparation for service. See, if you're real proud, you don't want to serve. You want to be served. And you know what? When you got a title, when you walk among the people that don't have one, how do you walk? You don't want to serve nobody. You want somebody to serve you. Well, you that think like this, you can't claim Jesus. You cannot claim Muhammad. You cannot claim Ibrahim or the prophets of God because you are absent those men. Any arrogant, proud, self-conceited, over-evaluated self is not connected to God at all. I'm almost finished. Now, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring Jesus to the witness stand. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm a defense attorney. I want to I wanna ask Jesus about himself. And you know, if we were to ask Muhammad, peace be upon him, about himself, ask Abraham about himself, Ask the prophets about themselves, you would never hear them puffed up over their unique relationship to God. I'll come to Prophet Muhammad in a minute. But all these prophets look at Abraham as their father. And some who are Jews say Abraham was a Jew. Some who are Christians say Abraham was a Christian. The Quran said he was neither a Christian or a Jew. He was an upright man and he was not of the polytheists. Don't you realize that Abraham was before there was a Torah and before there was a gospel? So he could not have been what you claim him to be. Yet Jesus and Muhammad claimed Abraham as their father. Now let's reason. Come on. Jesus, yes. Quran asking a question. Did you tell these people to take yourself and your mother for a God? Beside Allah, Jesus' answer is written in the Quran. He says, It is not for me to speak anything like that. If I had done so, surely you would have known it because I know not what is in your mind, but you know what is in mine. That's Quran. Let's get to the Bible. Jesus, are you a God beside God? People said, good master. He said, why call it thou me good? There's none good but the Father. Look, look, look how humble he is. No, no, no. no. See, don't claim him. Don't claim him. Unless you want to walk behind him, don't claim him. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
and he hasn't saved you from false pride and arrogance and this sick disease condition of your heart, how could he be a savior for you and you are wrapped in the very destructive mind that the slave master mastered you with? Jesus, are you the author of the tremendous things that you do? You, you open the eyes of the blind, you make the deaf hear, you make the dumb speak, and you raise the dead to life. Is this by your power, Jesus? Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. Wait a minute. Did I hear you correctly, Jesus? Would you repeat that, please? I can of myself do nothing. Whatsoever the Father bids me to do, that I do. Oh, that's humility. Look, look, look. Jesus, would you speak to us about humility in his great sermon on the mount? He said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. How many of us love meekness? To be meek is exhibiting humility and patience. It's being gentle, but it's also being submissive to a power bigger than yourself. Do you feel like that, Chief? Jesus. How do you want us to follow you? He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now check this scripture out. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, when you're in this labor and you have not been successful, this Quran says, I have not revealed the Quran to you that you may be unsuccessful. Then why are we unsuccessful? See, we're unsuccessful because we're burdened with the heavy burden of sin and arrogance and a bloated self-concept. And you need rest because that's too heavy a burden for us to carry the burden of sin and a bloated self-concept. So you're puffed up with arrogance and pride. That's why organizations break apart because there's no real 
brotherhood there. That's why we fight and kill one another because we envy one another. We're jealous of one another when somebody has something that we think we should have and they don't have it. Well, we covet what they have because what they have makes us think they're more than what they are. And if I had it, people would think I'm more than what I am. So we overthrow people because we want their position. It's a disease. Now, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, a yoke is a contraption that they put on oxen, mules, to bind them together so that they walk together, they work together, they tread down the corn together, they do work together under a yoke. Well, Jesus said, not take your yoke. He said, take my yoke upon you. Who was he talking to? He talking first to some silly disciples. They were some trifling dudes. Like we are. We want the uppermost seat at the feast. Coming late as all get out, then want to walk all the way down to the front that somebody may see me. Damn it, if you want the first seat, be here first. If you come late, take a seat in the back and somebody may recognize you and then bring you to the front, but don't march here. Sit down. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus wants to bind us, subjugate us to him and his father or God in a mission that God has put on his shoulders, which you would think is a heavy burden. I remember when Brother Malcolm was assassinated and I was asked to be the minister in New York and to take his place, a place that I never wanted. When I got there, some of the ministers were with me one day and one said to me, Brother Minister, do you think you can ride this horse? I said, I can sit in the saddle and as long as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad holds the reins, It'll look like I'm riding the horse. Now, this was my spirit 40 or more years ago. I know I'm not the rider. I'm being ridden because I want my master to ride me. Take my yoke upon you, but don't take it until you learn of me. 
See, we learn about people, about his peripheral circumference. But when you learn of a man, you're learning of that which possesses him. You're learning of his spirit, his essence. You can't take the yoke of this mission on your shoulder if you're unwilling to be a student and learn of the man. Then he comes right behind that and he says, for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Why are your souls troubled? Your souls are troubled because of that wounded ego, that diseased heart, that overbearing feeling of self. That's a burden. But if you want to be yoked to Jesus or yoked to Muhammad, peace be upon them, yoked to them that they might tie us to God's work, then we got to learn of Muhammad. Not talk about him. You hear his name mentioned, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Really? Really? Sure, peace and blessings are upon him, but where's your peace? What happened to your blessings? You saying it for Muhammad. Muhammad got his. But you and I got ours to get and we can't get it unless we surrender and follow in the footsteps of Jesus and Muhammad. Keep their name out of your mouth unless you are willing to follow in their footsteps. Oh, I see, I see you. You didn't like that one, did you? Oh, I know you didn't like it. But hell, I'm going to say it again. See, Jesus didn't ask you to worship him. He didn't ask you to praise him, praise him, praise him. You know how you praise him? He said, come, what? Follow me. Come, follow me. Now look how humble Jesus was. This man emptied himself of self. And that is part of his preparation for service because he emptied himself of himself that he could accept his father as himself. See? He knocks. If you will open up unto me, I will come and sup with you. What does he mean, open up? See, if you open your ear to him, you're letting him in through his word. If you let him in, he'll begin to exercise us of our demons. And Lord knows we have a lot of demons that keep us from being the people that God wants us to be. Now, Jesus didn't think his yoke was that heavy. He said, my yoke is easy. 
My burden is light. Why, Jesus? Because I ain't carrying it. The Father is carrying the burden. And I have chosen to let the Father into me. Ooh, just follow me. I'm almost finished. <clears throat> he said, the disciples asked him, when are we going to see the Father? He said, have I been among you this long and you have not seen him? Now, yeah, check it out. Check it out. And Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father, for I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Me and my Father are one. Now that perfect submission of Jesus allowed God to enter into him and take over his being to such a degree that he could say, when you see me, you see him. And he was offering us, since the fall of Adam, a chance to come back to our original position as perfect reflections of God. But what is demanded is submission and humility. Now, Jesus took on the form of a servant. You remember reading about the Son of Man and his coming? And the Son of Man made himself of no reputation, but became obedient even unto death. He took on the form of a servant. This is the one that all the prophets were looking for that would come out of the East in the latter days. The Son of Man. Well, if he could make himself of no reputation, why must we be always proceeded by a title. Take my card. That's me on that card. But the Son of Man, the great Mahdi, could make himself of no reputation and show up to do a work of service. You mean to tell me we need a title to serve? If you're sick like that, and this medicine that I'm giving you doesn't help you, then fine. Go where you're happy and we won't miss you. Not in the least, because you are an enemy to brotherhood. If you can't serve, then get on out of here, because everybody in here is going to be a servant of God and a servant of the people. Otherwise, we don't want you.
So he became a servant. If you love God, what's wrong with subjugating yourself in his service? Is something wrong with that? If it was good for Jesus, if it was good for Muhammad, if it was good for Abraham, Moses, and Aaron, David, and Solomon, why isn't it good enough for us? Look at what he made of them by their subjugation to his will. Now here, I'm a student. I don't feel myself bigger or better than the next man. I have never met a man that I didn't see in him my superior in some way. You didn't hear me. I don't care how much I'm loved or honored all over the world. There's not a woman in this audience that is not my superior in some way. Well, are you just saying that, Farrakhan? No, I can't make no babies. I think that's very superior. <laughs> and not only that, there are some sisters here that are qualified in many fields of human endeavor that I might not be qualified in, but I work with the Bible and the Quran and the words of God, you know. That's my thing. Ain't no doubt about it. This is my thing. But each one of you have something that is greater than I in some respect. Otherwise, Jesus could not have been the servant of all if he didn't see the greatness of God in all. Are you listening to me? Why would he wash his disciples' feet? Them days, people walk barefoot, sandals, nasty and dirty out there. And some feet are ugly. And you go to a podiatrist or one of these people that fix your feet. That's their job, so they're not ashamed to put your foot in that water and go to scraping. And maybe... They might be scraping a long time to get all that stuff off your feet. But at the end of that, you reach in your pocket and you pay a fee. But she might not like your feet at all, but she liked the money that she get from fooling around with a nasty foot. But Jesus didn't get no reward from washing the feet of his disciples, he was teaching a lesson of humility. And look how powerful he became by being meek and humble and a servant. Then he said, he who would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. what? Servant. servant. See, and unfortunately, the slave master never taught us to serve each other. He taught us how to serve him. You a waiter in a restaurant, 
a white person comes in and a black person comes in, maybe the black person is first, but you serve the white person first because your head is kind of messed up. You know, you know how to serve other than your own, but you don't know how to serve one another. So service has to start someplace. So that's why I want to see us that are in the labor. I just want to see you look at yourself. First, look at yourself as a servant and develop the characteristic of humility that would allow us to serve. You'd be surprised how quick the spirit will change when good service is the hallmark of the mosque. Do you need a title to serve? No, or do you just need the love of God and the love of your brother and sister to serve? How can you love God whom you have never seen and hate your brother whom you see every day. I see you, my brothers. It delights me to serve you. Well, I need my shoe shine. Find a shoe shine boy. Don't come to me with your shoes. Well, there's a leak in my house. Go find a plumber. Uh, that, you better than me in that. I'm not a plumber. But if you've got a diseased head and heart, see, there's medicine in these books. Then come see me. I'll work with your head and your heart based on the word of God. But if I need a plumber, I'm not fiddling around with the pipes. That's your thing. Let me call you and pay you. Fix the pipe. We're putting on a new roof on both these buildings, over $300,000. Don't you think I'd like to keep the money in the pocket? And, but I can't, I don't know nothing about roofing. I had to call the roofer. That's his thing. We bought two new boilers so that you'll never have hot days in the summer and cool days in the winter. It's a lot of money. Well, if uh, I could do it, I would, but I, that ain't my thing. See, everybody got something that they contribute to the development of a society and a nation. All of you have talent. All of you have a gift. All of you have something to give that makes you who you are. So, I'm hoping that this uh, kind of uh, lecture will help to heal any wounds that you suffered from taking away a title. It's not that you can't get it. That's not what this is about. This is about qualifying us through service to bear a title that will not cause a wounded ego to injure the brotherhood but cause us to use our gift to serve the brotherhood. So, I thank all of you, thank you. 
for coming. I, I thank you all for listening. Can I close on this note? Sit down, please. Since 1984, 23 years, the media has called me everything but what I am. They have beaten me for 23 years as anti-white, anti-Semitic, anti-American, anti-gay, just anti. <laughs> when the media jumps on a man like that, they're hoping that they'll break the man and he'll run away and hide. The more they beat me, the stronger I got. Wait. And they were begging me to apologize for telling the truth. How could I apologize if I'm telling the truth? They say, well, this is terrible what you're saying. I say, well, come on, dialogue with me. Show me where I am wrong. I'm humble. I'll go in the public where I made my error and humbly ask your forgiveness. But don't think that I'm some beat down Negro that I'm going to apologize just because you say so. I don't fear you. You don't look like God to me. So they ask me, they say, Farrakhan, is this a sweeter, gentler Farrakhan? I said, it depends on which Farrakhan you want to see. I said, but if you come at me the wrong way, you find the same old Farrakhan still here. Why? It has nothing to do with me. But I have accepted God in me. I'm emptying myself daily of me. I'm dying every day so that he can live in me so that I can say, like Jesus said, Have I been among you this long and you have not seen him? There's nothing to me. I am nothing. But God is everything. So if I have a chance to submit my will to do God's will, that my eyes become his eyes. My ears become his ears. My tongue becomes his tongue. Don't tell me that that can't happen. The Quran says when fighting was enjoined on the Muslims, Allah says in the Quran, it was not you who slew them. It was I who slew them by your hand. Why don't you let God use you as a mighty warrior for the liberation of your people?
Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So whatever trial they wish to bring against me, I know they're after me. Because they don't like any man, particularly a black man, that won't bow down to white supremacy. I don't see nothing supreme but God. And when you have that kind of spirit, We become a powerful people because the power is not us. The power is God in us. Don't you want to be like that? Yes, sir. Well, then empty yourself of yourself. Empty that sick, wounded, arrogant, prideful, egotistic, self-conceited, thinking more of oneself than one should. Empty that out! And accept one who says, I am meek and lowly of heart. Learn of me and you will find rest unto your souls. I have taken on the burden now of the entire nation because it was mine anyway. I want to help you to help him share the burden. But if you think you are intelligent enough to carry the burden, you just broke down. But if you know you can't carry the burden, then will you let him in so he can make your burden easy and make the yoke light? I don't feel in any way burdened since I decided to take on the full range of the nation. You know, last year this time, I guess many of you thought you'd be visiting a funeral. And, and you might have thought you was going to be in my seat by this year this time. I don't say no, man. people got them kind of thoughts. If it's for you, it's all right. But it just so happened that God brought me back from the door of death. Wait a minute. Wait. Because I have one more thing to do. And I love this saying of Paul. When Paul said, you know, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Now it's stored up for me a crown, and I go to get it. But Paul said he, he just couldn't go and get what God had promised him because Christ was not yet formed in the people. How do you form God in a man? See, first, surrender. See our prayer service? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is great. Why is your hand raised? Why is your hand raised? 
It's an act of surrender. Show me your hands. That's what the police say. <laughs> Show me your hands. Because this is the stuff that does all the dirty work of the mind. But now when you surrender to God, show him your hand. I ain't got nothing here, nothing here. I surrender. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness there is no god but Allah. See when you open yourself up to God and humble yourself he begins to form in you himself see and that's what causes you to be able to have power to exercise these demons that you got but if you keep God on the outside when he wants to come on the inside then you'll never wake up one morning and say free at last <laughs> free at last see you're not free right now I don't care what you got you're burdened with the slave master's mind so Paul said let this mind be in you the same that was in Jesus and Muhammad. So I know it's time to go. Let me just leave you with this. You're not looking for a spook. When I say a spook, I mean some spirit. What you're looking for has spirit, but is not a spirit. Who are you looking for? Ahmadinejad from Iran. Oh Allah, he said. Yeah. He awaits the arrival of Imam Mahdi. Make us his followers. Well, Mahdi is a, a man. He's a human being. Who the Jews looking for? They're looking for a man. They're looking for the Messiah. Who the Christians looking for? You're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. You're not looking for no spirit or spook. You're looking for a man. Then don't deny God's presence in a man. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar All oh, praises due to Allah one more time for the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan Whoa 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 That's what you call Good breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, dessert, all of it. You don't want to leave without getting your personal DVD copy of today's message because these messages have to be studied and we should never take for granted because we heard it live in real time that we've retained it all. This is something we need to go back to and get this tape. So before everyone leaves, we don't want to break without prayer, but there are many who are visiting us today for their very first time. Can we see your hands? We want to recognize all of our beautiful brothers and sisters who are visiting today, not only here in Chicago, but throughout the country. And I want to ask, all of the students in the ministry class to step forward so that we can, in one voice, how many of you believe that what you heard this morning coming from your brother,
the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to be the truth and good for our people. Can I see? Let me see your beautiful black hand. All praises due to Allah. Well, if you believe it to be the truth, then what is left than for us to take a stand on that truth and let us grow, let us learn, let us enter into that process that we not only can become a servant, but that God can be fully manifested in our being. How many of you would like to organize, would like to unite, and would like to learn more of the teachings and the program of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? And let's help the man that we just heard this morning, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Stand up wherever you are. Just stand where you are. Stand up. All my beautiful brothers and sisters that raised their hand, stand. Don't feel bashful. Sisters, don't feel bashful. In Los Angeles, in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Indianapolis, I'd like on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to shake your hand and to welcome you personally to Mosque Mariam and the mosque throughout the country will be received by the student in the ministry class. Let's give these beautiful brothers and sisters a warm round of applause. All of the brothers and sisters that raised their hand, where are you now? Don't feel bashful. This is our day, this is our time, and we must unite as a people and be a strong brotherhood. Let not your applause die down. Keep your applause going because we want all of our beautiful visiting brothers and sisters this morning to feel welcomed and loved as we serve them. Come on, Mosque Mariam, let's please keep our applause loud and strong. We're welcoming home our beautiful brothers and sisters who will help us to spread this life-saving message all over Chicago, all over California, all over Wisconsin, all over Maryland, all over America, throughout Canada, all over London, England. Let us give a big, big round of applause as we welcome home these beautiful brothers and sisters who have made up their mind to accept their own and to be themselves, to become a member of their own nation, brothers and sisters, the mighty nation of Islam, a nationhood built on service to our people. Let us welcome them home all over America, brother and sister. Let your applause be heard. Let your spirit be felt. For the devil is angry this morning, but we're very exceedingly glad here at Mosque Mariam and in every mosque and study group throughout America because he lost all of these beautiful brothers and sisters that he thought he had in his death grip forever and ever. But all praise is due to Allah for the life-saving message of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad being taught by that beautiful black man among us, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. Let us hear it for our beautiful sister. Let us hear it for our beautiful brother. Let us hear it for our brothers and sisters all over America who are coming down the center aisle in unity with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the wisdom that he shared with us on this wonderful and historic Sunday morning. Let your applause be heard loud and strong, brother and sister. We want to make this last brother feel like he was the first brother. We want to welcome him home with a big, big round, a show of love and support for our beautiful brother who has come home to accept his own and to be himself, shaking the hand of our brother Ishmael on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We have one more brother. Let's put our hands together for our beautiful brother. Let's give him one big thunderous hand, dear family. Our beautiful young brother, look at the joy and the light in his eyes. Let us welcome home this wonderful, beautiful brother. Assalamu alaikum. Please be seated. I want to say something first to the Muslim community. Don't ever get up and leave until prayer is said, it's very disrespectful. And uh, you're supposed to set an example. And if you have some wares that you want to sell, you know, I'm going to put a stop to turning this house into a den of thieves 
or hustling people because your wares are more important to you than the respect that should be done as you open a meeting with prayer we close it with prayer so when you come be in your seats and when the prayer is said and the, the uh, class is dismissed then the students leave students don't get up out of the class until the teacher rings a bell or tells you that the class is dismissed so this is the last day that I want to see that okay Thank you. In, in, in other words, um, we're all in training. And we've got to learn manners. We've got to learn respect. We've got to learn a lot of things that we think we already know. You see? Um, we're going to Atlanta for the Day of Atonement. Um, we'll be in Atlanta, I think, on the 13th through the 16th. And there's a walkathon. It's... Um, a walk for life, a walk for prostate cancer. As you know, I was a victim of that. And by the grace of God, we overcame it so far. And we want our brothers <clears throat> to overcome cancer, but you cannot overcome it unless you do what is required to see whether or not you're a victim of it. And if you don't take an exam or a blood test or something that will point out that you may have it, then you, if you catch it early, you can win. But if you are afraid of a doctor, afraid of getting the exam, then brother, when you find out that you have it, and black men are dying very much from prostate cancer. So when you're 35 or over, get that test and we're asking everyone that may not even go to Atlanta to sign up for the walk I intend to be there walking and gathering as many black men in Atlanta to walk with me against death yes, prostate cancer all of the cancers that are afflicting our women all of the health diseases that we are suffering from but you are not taking care of yourself as you should you're not making visits to your doctor as you should you're just not careful about this beautiful thing that God gave us which is life itself so uh, if you have twenty dollars that you can register for the walk even if you don't walk you will help a brother in Atlanta to take the test and find out whether he or she has it. I would like myself to next year, God willing, if you help me with the Savior's Day gift, which I'm asking every believer to sacrifice a thousand dollars. I haven't asked for money in 20 years. And I thought about that. And I think that brother and sister laborers who have asked on my behalf but I'm asking this year don't say you can't do it say you'll try and guess what you meet somebody out there that's been affected by brother Farrakhan and they'll give a hundred or they'll give something to help you make your pledge but by next year this time it may cost about a quarter of a million dollars to have our own bus that you can get on and get a free exam. It will be our own prostate cancer bus and we'll go into black communities or communities across the city of Chicago, Joliet, downstate, and just take them in. You don't have to charge them, man. Just help your people if you can serve, your people will love you for serving them. So I, I, I thank you, and uh, Brother may have an announcement to make, and then uh, we'll um, be dismissed with prayer. Thank you very much. And anybody that used to sell things out in that vestibule, no more. No more. If you have something to sell, 
you go out here and sell it. But I remember Jesus getting very, very angry because people were coming, but they weren't coming to hear the message. They were coming to hustle the people. So we're going to stop this hustle. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.